You are listening to the Daily Homily for Magdala in the Holy Land. The disciples approached Jesus and said, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child over, placed it in their midst, and said, Amen, I say to you, Unless you turn and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one child such as this in my name receives me. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that their angels in heaven always look upon the face of my heavenly Father. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So when we pray this psalm today, let my prayer come before you, O Lord, and we believe we are endowed with the guardian angel who is always before the face of God, then it's an extra motive to have great confidence when we pray that we have that representative, that caretaker, that extraordinary angelic being who provides for us. And some people have a wonderful custom of praying every day to their guardian angel. Some people even pray three times a day to their guardian angel. Maybe it even leads them to say it by rote in a way that they don't even uh, remember what they're saying because of just pure habit and lack of attention. But it's an interesting thought that many Christians are praying to their guardian angel every day. And it can inspire us, maybe, if we don't do that, to start that practice. It's a very healthy practice because it connects us to the supernatural. We have to remember what Paul said, that we are not fighting battles of flesh in this world. We are fighting spiritual battles with the powers of heaven, the heavenly powers. And so when we were reading Job a couple of days ago, we had that uh, very fantastic scene where Satan is dialoguing with God and asking for permission to test Job. And we have all the theology of the fallen angels, but there are angels, the myriads of angels adoring and worshiping God, and that such an angel looks after me. To ponder that, it's not just a thought for a little child at bedtime, and we all learn that in our families, from our parents, from our grandparents, praying the prayers before we go to sleep. What a beautiful way to help a child into sleep through such prayers. And the child is exhausted after all the day running around, and they have that serenity, that gentleness of voice, those beautiful thoughts, and the imagination takes them on to a trip to heaven as they pray and fall asleep. And to wake up in the morning then with the company of the angels awaking the dawn and living in God's presence is the greatest development of the spiritual life is to live in God's presence, to be in God's presence in all moments in the moments of success and failure, in the moments of tears and joy, in the moments of hard work, in the moments of recreation, in the moments alone, the moments with others, to be in God's presence, God is always with us. And he is with us through many gifts, through, and he sustains the gifts, and he gives us the gifts, so the giver is with the gifts. There are no gifts without givers. And this, these supreme gifts of life are coming from the supreme giver of life. And that's our environment. Our environment isn't a horror movie, isn't just moving among criminals and bands of robbers and exploiters, people who are hostile, antagonistic, prejudiced against us. We're, We're living in the realm of angels, and this is where we belong. 
Imagine Adam and Eve in the garden, and God would come to walk with them in the cool of the garden in that beautiful, very anthropomorphic imagery. <clears throat> uh, and, but it's, it's much more than anthropomorphic imagery. It's the reality that God is with us, so close to us, and this is one of his major names in, in Revelation, in the history of God's people, Emmanuel, God with us. And God is with us through so many different ways, through his word, he is speaking to us, like we just heard his word now. And he is also with us through great personalities who have responded so well to him throughout history. And there we have the saints, like St. Jerome yesterday, and uh, or the day before, and St. Therese yesterday. And we have more saints coming up, the other St. Saint, Francis of Assisi, uh, the day after tomorrow. So we're living among saints, St. Saint Teresa of Avila in two weeks' time. So we're, that's our company, the communion of saints. It's interesting, isn't it? To live in the communion of saints. And if we look at that first reading of Job today, <clears throat> it's very much his living in the presence of God. And he has all those. We're in chapter 9 already now. The third reading, we had the first one, the beginning of the book, and then we had... Chapter 3, yesterday, and now we have chapter 9, so all of his friends have spoken and he's replying. And there is uh, Job ready to, to give answer, and he has such beautiful awareness in his mind and heart about God. About He's contemplating God, and this comes to expression in these words. God is wise in heart and mighty in strength. And we should pray in this Mass for humanity today, faced by the great strength and power of artificial intelligence and the open question if we will have wisdom in heart when we apply it. So we see that the contemplation Job had uh, two and a half thousand years ago, as is written, and then he's a figure that exists in pre biblical literature, um, that this uh, extraordinary personality. Uh, front of us is weighing in God his incredible majesty that unfolded the heavens, the stars, the constellations, and is wise in heart. The wisdom of the way nature is constructed, but also the wisdom of his laws for his people, to discover the wisdom of God in life. And then we are charged with the great uh, responsibility of reflecting wisely about life. There's so many things we can do, so many trips we could take, so many things we could buy. And when a grandparent and a parent helps a child to discover wisdom, it's not just what I can do, but what is wise to do. And here we see Job deeply immersed in the mystery of God, in the presence of God in his life, not just a God of power, but a God of wisdom. And that's a knowledge that's impregnated with love and responsibility and understanding of reality. It's uh, an extraordinary knowledge, wisdom. It's not just a technical, scientific knowledge. It's not a mathematical, engineering knowledge. It's the wisdom of what is best for life, for enduring life, for the flourishing of life. And so these are gifts that our world needs today in a very powerful way because we have such major resources, such incredible available education for everybody through college degrees and doctorates and postdoctorates and all kinds of institutes and libraries and web access to all kinds of information, but behavior often reveals a great lack of wisdom. We have so many kids who are addicted, so many marriages who break down so, which break down so quickly so many great failures in life, it seems that we have such great abilities and at the same time such incredible brokenness and we don't have our act together. And to acquire this wisdom and to live among the angels, to live in God's presence, that God is living with us, that we are living with him, this is key, key to our maturity.
Thank you for joining us today. If you want to learn more about Magdala, follow us on YouTube and on Facebook.